Section 5 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 8, Part 3, The Marquise de Gange by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 5 The Marquis did not need to seek long for the man who should give him his revenge. He had in his house a young page, some seventeen or eighteen years old, the son of a friend of his, who, dying without fortune, had on his deathbed particularly commended the lad to the Marquis. This young man, a year older than his mistress, could not be continually about her without falling passionately in love with her, and however much he might endeavor to hide his love, the poor youth was as yet too little practiced in dissimulation to succeed in concealing it from the eyes of the Marquis, who, after having at first observed its growth with uneasiness, began on the contrary to rejoice in it from the moment when he had decided upon the scheme that we have just mentioned the marquis was slow to decide but prompt to execute having taken his resolution he summoned his page and after having made him promise inviolable secrecy and having undertaken on that condition to prove his gratitude by buying him a regiment explained what was expected of him the poor youth to whom nothing could have been more unexpected than such a communication, took it at first for a trick by which the Marquis meant to make him own his love, and was ready to throw himself at his feet and declare everything. But the Marquis, seeing his confusion, and easily guessing its cause, reassured him completely by swearing that he authorized him to take any steps in order to attain the end that the Marquis had in view." As in his inmost heart the aim of the young man was the same, the bargain was soon struck. The page bound himself by the most terrible oaths to keep the secret, and the Marquis, in order to supply whatever assistance was in his power, gave him money to spend, believing that there was no woman, however virtuous, who could resist the combination of youth, beauty, and fortune. Unhappily for the Marquis, such a woman, whom he thought impossible, did exist— and was his wife. The page was so anxious to obey his master that from that very day his mistress remarked the alteration that arose from the permission given him, his prompt obedience to her orders, and his speed in executing them, in order to return a few moments the sooner to her presence. She was grateful to him, and in the simplicity of her heart she thanked him. Two days later the page appeared before her splendidly dressed, she observed and remarked upon his improved appearance, and amused herself in conning all over the parts of his dress, as she might have done with a new doll. All this familiarity doubled the poor young man's passion, but he stood before his mistress nevertheless, abashed and trembling, like Cherubino before his fair godmother. Every evening the Marquis inquired into his progress, and every evening the page confessed that he was no farther advanced than the day before. Then the Marquis scolded, threatened to take away his fine clothes, to withdraw his own promises, and finally to address himself to some other person. At this last threat, the youth would again call up his courage and promise to be bolder tomorrow, and on the morrow would spend the day in making a thousand compliments to his mistress's eyes, which she in her innocence did not understand. At last, one day, Madame de Perron asked him what made him look at her thus, and he ventured to confess his love. But then, Madame de Perron, changing her whole demeanor, assumed a face of sternness and bade him go out of her room. The poor lover obeyed, and ran in despair to confide his grief to the husband, who appeared sincerely to share it, but consoled him by saying that he had no doubt chosen his moment badly, that all women, even the least severe, had inauspicious hours in which they would not yield to attack, and that he must let a few days pass, which he must employ in making his peace, and then must take advantage of a better opportunity, and not allow himself to be rebuffed by a few refusals. And to these words the Marquis added a purse of gold, in order that the page might, if necessary, win over the Marquise's waiting woman." Guided thus by the older experience of the husband, the page began to appear very much ashamed and very penitent. But for a day or two the Marquise, in spite of his apparent humility, 
kept him at a distance at last reflecting no doubt with the assistance of her mirror and of her maid that the crime was not absolutely unpardonable and after having reprimanded the culprit at some length while he stood listening with eyes cast down she gave him her hand forgave him and admitted him to her companionship as before things went on in this way for a week the page no longer raised his eyes and did not venture to open his mouth and the marquise was beginning to regret the time in which he used to look and to speak when one fine day while she was at her toilet at which she had allowed him to be present he seized a moment when the maid had left her alone to cast himself at her feet and tell her that he had vainly tried to stifle his love and that even although he were to die under the weight of her anger he must tell her that this love was immense eternal stronger than his life the marquise upon this wished to send him away as on the former occasion but instead of obeying her the page better instructed took her in his arms the marquise called screamed broke her bell rope the waiting maid who had been bought over according to the marquis's advice had kept the other women out of the way and was careful not to come herself then the marquise resisting force by force freed herself from the page's arms rushed to her husband's room and there bare-necked with floating hair and looking lovelier than ever flung herself into his arms and begged his protection against the insolent fellow who had just insulted her but what was the amazement of the marquise when instead of the anger which she expected to see break forth the marquis answered coldly that what she was saying was incredible that he had always found the young man very well behaved and that no doubt having taken up some frivolous ground of resentment against him she was employing this means to get rid of him but he added whatever might be his love for her and his desire to do everything that was agreeable to her he begged her not to require this of him the young man being his friend's son and consequently his own adopted child it was now the marquise who in her turn retired abashed not knowing what to make of such a reply and fully resolving since her husband's protection failed her to keep herself well guarded by her own severity indeed from that moment the marquise behaved to the poor youth with so much prudery that loving her as he did sincerely he would have died of grief if he had not had the marquis at hands to encourage and strengthen him nevertheless the latter himself began to despair and to be more troubled by the virtue of his wife than another man might have been by the levity of his finally he resolved seeing that matters remained at the same point and that the marquise did not relax in the smallest degree to take extreme measures he hid his page in a closet of his wife's bedchamber and rising during her first sleep left empty his own place beside her went out softly double locked the door and listened attentively to hear what would happen he had not been listening thus for ten minutes when he heard a great noise in the room and the page trying in vain to appease it the marquis hoped that he might succeed but the noise increasing showed him that he was again to be disappointed soon came cries for help for the marquise could not ring the bell ropes having been lifted out of her reach and no one answering her cries he heard her spring from her high bed run to the door finding it locked rushed to the window which she tried to open the scene had come to its climax the marquis decided to go in lest some tragedy should happen or lest his wife's scream should reach some belated passer-by who next day would make him the talk of the town scarcely did the marquise behold him when she threw herself into his arms and pointing to the page said well monsieur will you still hesitate to free me from this insolent wretch yes madame replied the marquis for this insolent wretch has been acting for the last three months not only with my sanction but even by my orders the marquise remained stupefied then the marquis without sending away the page gave his wife an explanation of all that had passed and besought her to yield to his desire of obtaining a successor whom he would regard as his own child so long as it was hers 
but young though she was the marquise answered with a dignity unusual at her age that his power over her had the limits that were set to it by law and not those that it might please him to set in their place and that however much she might wish to do what might be his pleasure she would yet never obey him at the expense of her soul and her honour so positive an answer while it filled the husband with despair proof to him that he must renounce the hope of obtaining an heir but since the page was not to blame for this he fulfilled the promise that he had made bought him a regiment and resigned himself to having the most virtuous wife in france his repentance was not however of long duration he died at the end of three months after having confided to his friend the marquis d'urban the cause of his sorrows the marquis d'urban had a son of marriageable age he thought that he could find nothing more suitable for him than a wife whose virtue had come triumphantly through such a trial he let her time of mourning pass and then presented the young marquis d'urban who succeeded in making his attentions acceptable to the beautiful widow and soon became her husband more fortunate than his predecessor the marquis d'urban had three heirs to oppose to his collaterals when some two years and a half later the chevalier de bouillon arrived at the capital of the county of venassin the chevalier de bouillon was a typical rake of the period handsome young and well grown the nephew of a cardinal who was influential at rome and proud of belonging to a house which had privileges of suzerainty the chevalier in his indiscreet fatuity spared no woman and his conduct had given some scandal in the circle of madame de maintenon who was rising into power one of his friends having witnessed the displeasure exhibited toward him by louis the fourteenth who was beginning to become devout thought to do him a service by warning him that the king garde undante against him translator's note garde undante that is to keep up a grudge means literally to keep a tooth against him pardieu replied the chevalier i am indeed unlucky when the only tooth left to him remains to bite me this pun had been repeated and had reached louis the fourteenth so that the chevalier presently heard directly enough this time that the king desired him to travel for some years he knew the danger of neglecting such intimations and since he thought the country after all preferable to the bastille he left paris and arrived at avignon surrounded by the halo of interest that naturally attends a handsome young persecuted nobleman the virtue of madame d'urban was as much cried up at avignon as the ill behavior of the chevalier had been reprobated in paris a reputation equal to his own but so opposite in kind could not fail to be very offensive to him therefore he determined immediately upon arriving to play one against the other nothing was easier than the attempt m d'urban sure of his wife's virtue allowed her entire liberty the chevalier saw her wherever he chose to see her and every time he saw her found means to express a growing passion whether because the hour had come for madame d'urban or whether because she was dazzled by the splendor of the chevaliers belonging to a princely house her virtue hitherto so fierce melted like snow in the may sunshine and the chevalier luckier than the poor page took the husband's place without any attempt on madame d'urban's part to cry for help as all the chevalier desired was public triumph he took care to make the whole town acquainted at once with his success then as some infidels of the neighborhood still doubted the chevalier ordered one of his servants to wait for him at the marquise's door with a lantern and a bell at one in the morning the chevalier came out and the servant walked before him ringing the bell at this unaccustomed sound a great number of townspeople who had been quietly asleep awoke and curious to see what was happening opened their windows they beheld the chevalier walking gravely behind his servant who continued to light his master's way and to ring along the course of the street that lay between madame d'urban's house and his own as he had made no mystery to any one of his love affair nobody took the trouble even to ask him whence he came however as there might possibly be persons still unconvinced he repeated this same jest for his own satisfaction three nights running so that by the morning of the fourth day 
nobody had any doubts left. As generally happens in such cases, Monsieur Durban did not know a word of what was going on until the moment when his friends warned him that he was the talk of the town. Then he forbade his wife to see her lover again. The prohibition produced the usual results. On the morrow, as soon as Monsieur Durban had gone out, the Marquise sent for the Chevalier to inform him of the catastrophe in which they were both involved. But she found him far better prepared than herself for such blows, and he tried to prove to her, by reproaches for her imprudent conduct, that all this was her fault, so that at last the poor woman, convinced that it was she who had brought these woes upon them, burst into tears. Meanwhile, M. Durban, who, being jealous for the first time, was the more seriously so, having learned that the Chevalier was with his wife, shut the doors, and posted himself in the antechamber with his servants in order to seize him as he came out. But the Chevalier, who had ceased to trouble himself about Madame d'Urban's tears, heard all the preparations, and suspecting some ambush, opened the window, and although it was one o'clock in the afternoon and the place was full of people, jumped out of the window into the street, and did not hurt himself at all, though the height was twenty feet, but walked quietly home at a moderate pace. The same evening, the Chevalier, intending to relate his new adventure in all its details, invited some of his friends to sup with him at the pastry-cook Lecoq's. This man, who was a brother of the famous Lecoq, of the Rue Montorgueil, was the cleverest eating-housekeeper in Avignon. His own unusual corpulence commended his cookery, and when he stood at the door constituted an advertisement for his restaurant. The good man, knowing with what delicate appetites he had to deal, did his very best that evening, and that nothing might be wanting waited upon his guests himself. They spent the night drinking, and toward morning the Chevalier and his companions, being then drunk, espied their host standing respectfully at the door, his face wreathed in smiles. The Chevalier called him nearer, poured him out a glass of wine, and made him drink with them. Then, as the poor wretch, confused at such an honor, was thanking him with many bows, he said, Pardieu, you are too fat for Lecoq. I must make you a capon. This strange proposition was received as men would receive it who were drunk and accustomed by their position to impunity. The unfortunate pastry-cook was seized, bound down upon the table, and died under their treatment. The vice-legate, being informed of the murder by one of the waiters, who had run in on hearing his master's shrieks and had found him covered with blood in the hands of his butchers, was at first inclined to arrest the chevalier and bring him conspicuously to punishment. But he was restrained by his regard for the Cardinal de Bouillon, the chevalier's uncle, and contented himself with warning the culprit that unless he left the town instantly he would be put into the hands of the authorities. The chevalier, who was beginning to have had enough of Avignon, did not wait to be told twice, ordered the wheels of his chaise to be greased and horses to be brought. In the interval, before they were ready, the fancy took him to go and see Madame d'Urban again. As the house of the Marquise was the very last at which, after the manner of his leaving it the day before, the chevalier was expected at such an hour, he got in with the greatest ease, and meeting a lady's maid, who was in his interests, was taken to the room where the Marquise was. She, who had not reckoned upon seeing the Chevalier again, received him with all the raptures of which a woman in love is capable, especially when her love is a forbidden one. But the Chevalier soon put an end to them by announcing that his visit was a visit of farewell, and by telling her the reason that obliged him to leave— the Marquise was like the woman who pitied the fatigue of the poor horses that tore Damien limb from limb. All her commiseration was for the Chevalier, who, on account of such a trifle, was being forced to leave Avignon. At last, the farewell had to be uttered, and as the Chevalier, not knowing what to say at the fatal moment, complained that he had no memento of her, the Marquise took down the frame that contained a portrait of herself corresponding with one of her husband and tearing out the canvas, rolled it up, and gave it to the chevalier. The latter, so far from being touched by this token of love, laid it down as he went away upon a piece of furniture, where the marquise found it a half an hour later. She imagined that his mind, being so full of the original, 
he had forgotten the copy and representing to herself the sorrow which the discovery of this forgetfulness would cause him she sent for a servant gave him the picture and ordered him to take horse and ride after the chevalier's chaise the man took a post-horse and making great speed perceived the fugitive in the distance just as the latter had finished changing horses he made violent signs and shouted loudly in order to stop the postilion but the postilion having told his fare that he saw a man coming on at full speed the chevalier supposed himself to be pursued and bade him go on as fast as possible this order was so well obeyed that the unfortunate servant only came up with the chaise a league and a half farther on having stopped the postilion he got off his horse and very respectfully presented to the chevalier the picture which he had been bidden to bring him but the chevalier having recovered from his first alarm bade him go about his business and take back the portrait which was of no use to him to the sender the servant however like a faithful messenger declared that his orders were positive and that he should not dare go back to madame d'urban without fulfilling them the chevalier seeing that he could not conquer the man's determination sent his postilion to a farrier whose house lay on the road for a hammer and four nails and with his own hands nailed the portrait to the back of his chaise then he stepped in again bade the postilion whip up his horses and drove away leaving madame d'urban's messenger greatly astonished at the manner in which the chevalier had used his mistress's portrait at the next stage the postilion who was going back asked for his money and the chevalier answered that he had none the postilion persisted then the chevalier got out of his chaise unfashioned madame d'urban's portrait and told him that he need only put it up for sale in avignon and declare how it had come into his possession in order to receive twenty times the price of his stage the postilion seeing that nothing else was to be got out of the chevalier accepted the pledge and following his instructions precisely exhibited it next morning at the door of a dealer in the town together with an exact statement of the story the picture was bought back the same day for twenty-five louis as may be supposed the adventure was much talked of throughout the town next day madame d'urban disappeared no one knew whither at the very time when the relatives of the marquis were met together and had decided to ask the king for a lettre de cachet one of the gentlemen present was entrusted with the duty of taking the necessary steps but whether because he was not active enough or whether because he was in madame d'urban's interests nothing further was heard in avignon of any consequences ensuing from such steps in the meantime madame d'urban who had gone to the house of an aunt opened negotiations with her husband that were entirely successful and a month after this adventure she returned triumphantly to the conjugal roof two hundred pistoles given by the cardinal de bouillon pacified the family of the unfortunate pastry cook who at first had given notice of the affair to the police but who soon afterwards withdrew their complaint and gave out that they had taken action too hastily on the strength of a story told in joke and that further inquiries showed their relative to have died of an apoplectic stroke thanks to this declaration which exculpated the chevalier de bouillon in the eyes of the king he was allowed after travelling for two years in italy and in germany to return undisturbed to france thus ends not the family of Gange but the commotion which the family made in the world from time to time indeed the playwright or the novelist calls up the pale and blood-stained figure of the marquise to appear either on the stage or in a book but the evocation almost always ceases at her and many persons who have written about the mother do not even know what became of the children our intention has been to fill this gap that is why we have tried to tell what our predecessors left out and try offer to our readers what the stage and often the actual world offers comedy after melodrama end of section five end of celebrated crimes volume eight part three the marquise de Gange. end of celebrated crimes by alexander dumas translated by george burnham ives recording by john van stan savannah georgia